finish line. So for today's lab, just one experiment, we're going to do bacterial transformation. Um, using the PGLO system, this is a system um, developed by um, BioRad. Um, so it's a kit that we purchased um, of, of supplies uh, to be able to do this experiment for today. So everything has been worked out for us. Um, although I can say I already peeked at our plates from yesterday and something's not working, uh, which is fine too. That's a great teachable moment, right? We'll talk about what went wrong, right? And try and troubleshoot what didn't work um, for, the, for this system. So sometimes it doesn't work, right? And that's okay. So we are going to try to do transformation today. Hopefully, maybe we will be successful. These three mice, uh, these three mice, um, <laughs> I just had a nursery rhyme go through my head, um, <laughs> have been transformed. Um, and you can see that two of the three um, are doing something we don't usually see mice do. What do you see? They're glowing, right? They're glowing green. Their eyes are glowing green, right? Their little tails are grow glowing green. And the reason for this is that they've been genetically altered, right? They have been given the information on how to make green fluorescent protein. And you can see that, just like with any experiment, right, whether I don't, I don't know if this was the control group or it didn't work, for that particular mouse in the middle, notice he is not glowing, right? It, it didn't work or he was the control group. I don't know. I didn't steal this picture. <laughs> I need to do find out where Peter got it, though. I've seen it on the Internet, though. So uh, we can do this for eukaryotes, right? And at the organism level, right, they've genetically modified this mouse to glow green. Why on heck would you want a green glowing mouse. Seems kind of ridiculous, huh? Right? But when you watch this next video, which I gotta close this to get it to open, it'll make sense as to why a scientist would maybe want to make something fluoresce a particular color. So what we have here is fruit fly sperm. Whenever I say sperm, people pay attention. Especially over the summer when I teach the high school and junior high students, right? So that's sperm swimming around. What do you notice about the sperm? It's a short video. I wish I could put it on the loop. Not a lot of the green ones, right? But look closely. There are red ones too, right? So what they did is they genetically altered one male fruit fly so that his sperm produced the green fluorescent protein. So using fluorescence and, and microscopy, they can see his sperm, right, are green. And they took another male fruit fly and they genetically altered his sperm so that they're red. And what female fruit flies do is they mate with more than one male. Ooh, they some serious women. Right, why do they do that? Exactly, genetic diversity. Right? They want their children to be as diverse as possible, so it increases the likelihood that they'll be fit and they'll survive, right? Natural selection. Right? That's what she wants. Right? She wants genetically diverse children. Does the sperm want that or the male? No, they want to be the winner, right? Just my babies, that's it. Nobody else's babies. Right? So these sperm, because they were able to color them differently, they have been able to observe competition between the sperm to get to the egg. And then they didn't stop there. They're like, okay, well, that doesn't, that kind of defeats the purpose of multiple mating, right? The female's mating with all these males, but they're competing, and so somebody's going to win, right, if they're competing? Hmm, not the end of the story. They were able to detect the presence of chemicals in the female reproductive tract, and that's what you're seeing here, her female, her reproductive tract where the sperm are. She produces chemicals that tries to decrease the competition, right? Because again, her goal is to have diverse children. She doesn't want just one male to win, right? She wants to make it a fair competition. 
for those eggs. Make sense? So you can see how beneficial this would be, right? You know, we talk about genetic modification, and I, I have to say that I'm not a huge fan of modifying our foods, right? Um, I don't think we know enough about it, and I don't think we're going about some of the things probably in the best way. That's my personal opinion. Um, but genetic modification can really be really awesome. Um, so it can help us with discoveries like this, help us visualize the difference between these two sperm. I mean, before we could do something like this, we didn't even know this competition was happening, right? Um, we have made human insulin. We have, excuse me, given bacteria DNA that tells bacteria how to make human insulin. So the diabetics don't have reactions because we're not having to take insulin from pigs anymore, which is slightly different from humans, and we're also not preying upon those poor pigs and stealing their insulin from them, right? We're making it in the laboratory with bacteria. They're making it and secreting it, and we're able to take that byproduct and purify it and give it to diabetics to save their life, right? Because without it, they would die. Type 1 diabetics, that is, that do not produce insulin or not effective insulin. But what do anyone have, know anyone who's diabetic? What, what do they have to worry about with their insulin? Refrigeration, right? It's a protein. Te it's affected by temperature. Well, they have genetically modified insulin now where it's more temperature stable where they don't have to carry around an ice pack. They don't have to worry about their insulin as intensely as they did in the past. Now, granted, you can't, you know, leave it in the car, you know, in a 100-degree day in Louisiana, right? That's still going to be too hot, right? But at normal room temperature, it'll be fine, right? It's not going to denature. It's not going to change that protein. But that's also why they have to inject it. Because think about it. If you swallowed that in pill form, what would your digestive system do to a protein? D digest it. Break it down into the amino acids. We need it in the whole normal protein form in the bloodstream in order for it to work. And so that's why, unfortunately, they have to inject it or some people have pumps <coughs> injected it for them. Um, so they're trying to come up with one where they could um, do it as a mist, where you could absorb it through your mucous membranes right, instead of having to do an injection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have to pay for this technology. <laughs> Not yet. So then you can also do fun things like they did here, where these are bacteria and, and that's what we're going to be doing, prokaryotes today, um, that have been genetically modified to produce these fluorescent proteins. Um, there's lots of different fluorescent proteins, and what somebody did was literally take different fluorescent bacteria and draw with them on a Petri dish. So I had a little bit of fun myself the other day, and I actually drew some stuff with our um, fluorescent E. coli that I'll show you guys in a little bit. Um, the kids over the summer actually worked with really huge Petri dishes with one of the professors here, they transformed their own bacteria, and then they drew with them on huge Petri dishes with the aid of the art department. Um, and, and they drew, like, Florida de lis and hearts and stuff like that. And um, it's in our, our current um, pamphlet that we have for the summer program that we do here. So, and, and I was giving some to my son's school, and he stole one of the pamphlets because the pictures they used were for me teaching last summer. And he's like, Mommy, you're famous. I'm like, yeah, not really, but okay. He's like, I want one. <laughs> so he took one of the pamphlets because it had my picture in it of me teaching in the lab, the, the, the junior high students over the past summer. So um, it's not that difficult, right, um, of a procedure. Uh, it's done a lot in laboratories um, for different types of research, right? So I gave you guys some examples, right? The, the, the list goes on and on and on. Um, transformation does happen in nature, and that's how we were able to have these things um, and adapt it for a, a lab setting, is that it happens in nature. And so 
um, transformation is picking up of the DNA from one bacteria and incorporating it into another one. Um, and when that bacteria incorporates it, this is information to do something, right? So in the case of green fluorescent protein, it can make that because it has the DNA that tells it how to make that, right? How to make that transformation, right? So and they incorporate it into their own chromosome. Today we're actually not going to incorporate it into anything into a chromosome. We're going to actually use a plasmid, which is a circular piece of DNA um, that they'll keep separate from their chromosome. Um, and this is very common for bacteria to have extra DNA in the form of a plasmid, a circular piece of DNA with additional information on it. So has anybody ever heard of superbugs? Superbugs. What does it make? Why, why are they called super? It's not good news for us, y'all. They're resistant to what? They're resistant to antibiotics, right? How did they become resistant? People don't take all their medicine, right? And so by selective pressure, right, we have made it so that there are more organisms out there that are resistant. But the truth of the matter, the kernel of it, right, is bad use, overuse, right, uh, of antibiotics. But that in itself isn't why. The reason is the organisms change, right, and they end up having these abilities. And if they survive, then more of them have these abilities, right, because they share these abilities. So one of the abilities that we're going to talk about today right, allows them to be resistant. So we talked about this, remember back at the beginning of this half of the semester, we talked about antibiotic resistance, right? What does an antibiotic have to do? It has to go where? Inside the cell. So can all antibiotics get into all cells? No, E. coli was resistant to penicillin, right? What was the problem with that? Can't get past outer membrane because they're gram negatives, right? So we have a problem with some of them not even getting in. And then some antibiotics, even when it gets in, the bacteria does what? Throws it out. It's like, uh-uh, this is bad stuff. You get out of here, right? Or the bacteria comes in, I mean, excuse me, the antibiotic comes in the bacteria. And then what does it have to do to actually work? So for instance, with Penicillin, it interferes with peptidoglycan synthesis, right? So the organism is making the pieces to make the cell wall. How does it do that? How does it make stuff? How do cells make stuff? What do we call that process? It's a chemical reaction, right? What do you need for chemical reactions, especially in biological systems, in order for it to go? How do you turn one molecule into another molecule? What's the helper there? An enzyme. An enzyme. So typically what the antibiotics are binding to is those enzymes involved in the process. So especially with making proteins, what structure in our cells that you could almost consider an enzyme makes proteins? What makes proteins in our cells? All cells for that matter. What makes proteins? That's what they are. You guys know this. You said it. Ribosomes. Ribosomes, right? So we have antibiotics like streptomycin. They bind to the ribosome and interfere with protein synthesis. That's how they hurt the cell. Well, if you change your ribosome, like maybe the ribosomal RNA sequence, and now when streptomycin comes in, it can't bind anymore, you are now what we call antibiotic resistant, right? Because you've genetically changed. That antibiotic can't bind anymore. It can't stop you. One more way that they can be resistant. Anybody know? So antibiotic comes in, right? What's another way we could stop an antibiotic from working once it gets in the cell? Why is it? Huh? If it feeds on it, right? So there are some bacteria that have enzymes that destroy the molecule, right? 
the destroy the penicillin molecule. So in uh, 2009, December, a Swedish man acquired a Klebsiella pneumonia infection um, while in India that was resistant to the cam penum, 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 I can never say this drug. Um, it's, it's similar to penicillin in that it has a structure, right, similar to penicillin, has this beta-lactam ring. And what they found out is the reason why that strain of Klebsiella pneumonia was resistant to this antibiotic is that the organism had acquired the DNA on how to make the enzyme that we refer to as beta-galactinase that can break this ring structure found in this antibiotic and all the penicillins. So you can't give any penicillin-like drugs, right, for this infection. None of them. None of the modified ones, nothing. They all have this ring structure. And when it goes in, the enzyme breaks it and activates it. So, Klebsiella, uh, as I said, they found a plasmid, circular piece of DNA. It had this gene on it that we refer to as BLA for beta-galactinase, right? Uh, New Delhi, uh, Melitillo just refers to, again, where it is that they discovered this, right? So that became part of the name of the gene, of that segment of DNA that makes this enzyme. Right. And we're going to talk about genes today, right? We're going to give DNA, right? A whole set of DNA information that they can use to make something. And one of the things that we're going to give them today is beta-galactinase, right? We're going to purposely give our, our E. coli the ability to make this enzyme and destroy penicillin-like drugs. In the case of today's experiment, which penicillin-like drug are we using? Look at your plate. We're using ampicillin. We're going to destroy ampicillin today. We're going to laugh at it. Ha ha. Can't get me. Right? So, but how did this happen? How did it get this DNA? It got it from one of its friends, right? Who mutated and developed this enzyme. So, it moved what we call horizontally. Not vertically. Vertically would be from it to all of its offspring. Horizontally is from one bacteria to another. Yeah, so one bacteria dies, right? Its DNA becomes part of the environment. Another bacteria comes along and grabs that DNA and utilizes it. That's called transformation. Those of you guys are in lecture, you know there's two other ways in which that can happen. The DNA can move laterally or horizontally from one bacteria to another. One of them involves the sex papillus. What is that process called? Conjugation. The other involves a, a virus moving the, bact the bacterial DNA from one bacteria to another. That one's called trans transduction. transduction, right? So we don't know exactly how this happened. We may never know, right? But it has happened and continues to happen. And this is one of the scary things as it relates to resistance, right? Is this ability of DNA for resistance to antibiotics specifically can go from one bacteria to another. Right. So they, uh, in 2010, found 180 isolates. So 180 bacteria, right, were found to be resistant to multiple classes of antibiotics. So not just penicillin-like drugs, but other drugs as well. So uh, fluoroclomenones, um, uh, micro, I mean, aminoglycosides, which include um, streptomycin, right? Uh, they were still susceptible, uh, susceptible to polymyxin um, antibiotic uh, uh, col colistin. But colistin is what we used in our, in our plates, right? The problem with this is they don't usually give it to patients because it can be toxic, right? So you have to be very careful in the administration of this antibiotic, right? So hence why, you know, we don't want this to be our only choice, right? This is not our best choice. But it could potentially be, for some organisms, our only choice. And then is there the potential that we have no choices? It's in our very near future, y'all, that we will end up with bacteria 
that are resistant to all currently known antibiotics. This is a real threat, right, that could happen very soon in our lifetime, like in the next five to ten years, if not sooner. So most of us are aware of some pathogenic strains of microorganisms that are resistant. They're known by this resistance, right, these strains, one of them being MRSA, right, Mictalin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And we even have VRSA, right? We have vancomycin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Um, we have extremely drug-resistant strains of tuberculosis, where most of the drugs that we use, it's resistant against, right? We're left with a very small number of not our first choice drugs to give to these patients. We may go back to when antibiotics weren't discovered, right? and you had to pray your immune system could get you through the storm. Many people will die if that happens. That's the scary thing. So I've already talked about E. coli 0157 in my lecture class, so a little bit of review for you guys. So E. coli 0157 produces the shiga toxin. How does it know how to make the shiga toxin? Where is that information in itself? In its DNA. Did it always have this ability? No, this is a specialized strain. It picked up this DNA from its friend called Shigella. That's why it's called the Shiga toxin. Shigella produces this toxin, right? How the heck did E. coli get his friend's toxin? He got his friend's DNA. Did he conjugate with him? Did he transform? Did he pick up DNA from a dead friend of Shigella? Or did transduction happen? Did a virus help in this process? We don't know. But we definitely know it happened because that toxin is from Shigella. E. coli didn't used to have it, but it does now. Some strains of it have it. And it's extremely destructive to the intestinal tract, right? You have severe dysentery, right? Bloody diarrhea, destruction to your intestines. You would not be sitting in this class if you had this infection, right? Right? It's bad news for us, for sure. We're not going to make, um, we are going to make antibiotic resistant bacteria in this lab, right? So again, we're not going to obviously take it out of this lab, right? Uh, we're doing it under safe um, conditions and we're not going to put it into the environment and we're going to destroy it, right? We're just using it for um, scientific uh, research. In order to do this, in order for transformation to happen, cells have to be what's referred to as competent. And only about 1% of the known bacteria are naturally competent. So it have the ability to do transformation. And it has actually been found that um, you need about 40 different genes, right? 40 different pieces of information and abilities to actually cause transformation to happen um, as it's been studied in Bacillus uh, subtilis. So it's quite complex, right? Um, for this process. It isn't as simple as it may appear, right, in this experiment today. Um, it requires energy, too, right? Um, they have to actually expend energy to pick up this DNA. It's evolved as a potential way of repairing DNA, especially for prokaryotes. Um, transformation gives them the opportunity to maybe pick up undamaged DNA. When they have become damaged, they typically only have one copy of all their genetic information. Unlike us, right, we have two copies. You basically, for certain things, you have a backup copy. Because you don't actually need both copies of DNA to do that function for most of the things that we do. So if you get a defective copy from one parent, you've got a good copy from the other one, you're saved. You have genetic disease when you get two defective copies, right? You have full-blown sickle cell anemia, both your parents gave you the wrong information on how to make hemoglobin, right? That's how we end up with genetic disease. Bacteria don't have moms and dads, right? They just have moms. So if mom's code is bad or gets messed up when she's passing it on, how do they fix themselves? Well, one of the ways is they could pick up this DNA from the environment, right? And hopefully one of his neighbors wasn't damaged, right? 
and he can patch his system, right? Um, it's also referred to as a primitive form of sexual reproduction, right? Because what sexual reproduction is, is exchange of genetic information, okay? Uh, they don't really do that. They don't have to do that, right? Bacteria can reproduce asexually, right? It, sexual reproduction is not required for them like it is for us. Does that make sense to you guys? Right. So it's all about the DNA, right? It's all about patching it, using it, maintaining it, and especially if it's giving you advantage, um, even better. So there's different ways you can make um, cells competent. One of the ways is electroporation. As the name implies, we're going to use what to get the DNA into the cells? Electroporation. What does that use? Electricity, right? So, of course, um, that makes the membranes more permeable, and we can stick other stuff in there other than DNA. They use electroporation to get drugs in, to get chemicals into cells. But as you can imagine, um, and we can do this for prokaryotes or eukaryotes, it's costly. You need a special machine, right? You need special uh, materials, vessels to put your samples in. We don't have this at Delgado. But other places where they're doing this type of procedure very often, they would have or maybe utilize this type of equipment. I've never actually seen or used this. Um, when I worked in research and when I was in graduate school, um, we, we use, we use chemi uh, um, chemically competent cells, commercially available chemically competent cells, right? And that's what we're using today. Um, we're we're going to use chemical, chemicals to make them more permeable. We're going to use a calcium chloride solution. It's referred to as a transformation solution. That's what's already in your tubes, right, is this calcium chloride solution. And this is going to help us in getting the cells to uptake the DNA. Right? And we're using a special line of cells that are more susceptible to this type of competency. Do you need to go, Byron? You should keep looking at your phone. It's slightly distracting. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so this actually allows double-stranded RNA to be taken up from the environment. During normal um, transformation, they would only take in a single strand of the DNA. But in this case, they're going to take in a whole circular piece of DNA. They're going to take in a whole plasmid, right, under these um, conditions. So as I said, they're commercially available kits. Um, this is an example of one that's commonly used in research, especially when I was in grad school at Southeastern. We used um, kits just like this one, um, where it comes with all the supplies that you need, right? It has the cells. Um, it even has a control plasmid. And they have different efficiency levels, right? how effective it is, how many cells actually get transformed in this system. So you can buy ones that are highly efficient um, and others that aren't quite as efficient. Just depends on your goal, right? What do you, what are you trying to accomplish would determine um, what you're using. So they already have the cells aliquoted out in little tubes, right? And even the specialized food for them. And a positive um, control plasmid. So some terminology. Transformation is the process in which bacterial cells take up exogenous from outside DNA and bring it inside and incorporate it. In order to do this, the cells have to be what we call competent, right? They have to have the ability to take up the DNA. We're going to be working with bioluminescence today, right? So we're working with green fluorescent protein. Um, this can emit light when UV light is shined on it. It will excite electrons, they'll excite back towards the ground state, and they will emit light. That's referred to as bioluminescence. Anyone know what eukaryotic organisms this was discovered in? What? Jellyfish. Yeah, jellyfish. Jellyfish. So um, I haven't been there in a while, but I'm actually going to the IMAX theater on Monday. But um, the Audubon uh, Audis, uh, Aquarium has a really great jellyfish um, exhibit. And you'll notice they're in kind of dark tanks. Although I, I'll have to say I don't know for sure if um, any of them are bioluminescent or actually fluorescent. There's one of them I got really excited when I saw it one day. It has these little tiny projections like cilia on it that it beats. And because of this, if you actually read the placard that's next to it, right, 
it says that those little um, projections act like little prisms, right? So what does a prism do to light? It splits it into its different colors, right? It refracts the light. The different colors move at different speeds. So when you refract them through a prism, they separate, right? Um, so that's what's happening. These guys look like they have little rainbows running along them, but they're refracting the light. Their, their, their structures on them refract the light, and so that's what you're seeing. You're seeing refraction of light. Um, you're not seeing bioluminescence for that particular one. But light's cool, right? <laughs> Um, so, you know, this scientific explanation, the, you know, layman's terms, we're going to excite electrons with the, with the UV light. They're going to bounce up, and then when they rest back, when they travel back down to their ground state, they're going to emit light, right? They're going to generate light energy. So, small wavelengths mean high energy. So, actually, UV light has a lot of energy in it because it's a very small wavelength. So much so that it's not within the visible light spectrum. You don't see ultraviolet light, right? Um, but we will see the fluorescence, right? Because it will fluoresce back at a lower, uh, at, a, at a smaller, larger wavelength, right? So UV light, small wavelength, right? But then it's going to emit larger wavelength, so we will actually see it. It'll be within the visible light spectrum. All the conditions have been worked out already for this experiment, right? We don't have to tweak anything, per se. <laughs> uh, we know how many cells to use. Uh, we know how much DNA to use, right? I will actually measure out the amount of DNA that I give to each table. Um, we know the transformation efficiency, about how many transformed cells we should get for milligram of DNA, right? It's a measured amount of DNA that I'm going to add into each one of your tubes. Um, so for this system, they say we should get about 75 uh, transformed cells per plate, right? So we should get 75 colonies of growing, glowing E. coli, right? Green glowing E. coli. We could do, and if we didn't know, you could do serial dilutions to calculate this out, right? We could do dilution. Yeah, I know, right? Remember, it's on the final. It's coming back around. Uh, and I have some calculations here we'll talk about next time. Um, we're going to talk about them this time. Um, so it's a circular piece of DNA. It's a plasmid, right? And it's a design plasmid. So it has specific information on it that they purposely put together, right? They, they um, engineered this. So on this plasmid, we have the beta-galactinase enzyme, right, that can destroy penicillin-like drugs. In this case, we're using ampicillin. So we're going to give them ampicillin resistance. Um, so that DNA segment can be made into the protein that is the enzyme that destroys beta-lactinase rings. We're also going to give it the ability to make green fluorescent protein. Right? So in the DNA on this plasmid tells that cell how to make green fluorescent protein. So when we shine the UV light on it, it fluoresces green. But, we're a little tricky in this, is that we're using an operon, an operating system for this. Do you always express all of your DNA? Do you always make all the proteins that your DNA knows how to make all the time? No, right? That would be a waste of energy. Just like for E. coli, right? It doesn't usually see lactose, right? You usually digest and absorb lactose in your small intestines. So when it gets to your E. coli in your gut, there's no more lactose left, right? They don't get to eat it, but they love it, right? We've seen that on our plates, right? On our EMB plates, they, they're fluorescent green, right? Because they're producing a ton of acid from fermenting that lactose. So they have a control system. They have a way of sensing when lactose is present. They have special receptors in their membrane and special ports to bring in lactose when it's present. And so when they bring it in, what do they now need to do with that glu with that lactose cell? They need to be able to what? Why would you take in a sugar? What can you do with the sugar? You can break it down for energy, right? And building blocks. But you've got to have what to be able to break it down? How do we break down molecules? 
What do we need to, enzymes, right, to drive those chemical reactions? And again, where's that information on how to make those enzymes in the DNA? So you've got to take that DNA and make messenger RNA and make that protein now, right? Which they can do very quickly, right? But they're not going to make those enzymes if they're never going to see lactose, right? But when they see it, man, they're like, woohoo, lactose time, lactose party. Let's make lactose enzymes. Let's digest lactose, right? They're all excited about it. So we have these things under control system. So this is what we refer to as an operon, right? So there, you have the lac operon. In this case, we're going to use a different sugar. Anyone know what sugar we're using today? Sugars always end in OSE unless it's a sugar alcohol like mannitol. That's our sugar for today. Look on your plates. It's on one of our plates, too. No, the plate. Arabinose. We're using arabinose today. So there's an arabinose operon, right? Um, so with this, that means that they're not going to make digestive enzymes for arabinose unless it's present, right? When arabinose is present, then we make enzymes to digest arabinose, right? But we tricked the system here. Instead of making the enzymes to digest arabinose, we put the DNA there on how to make green fluorescent protein. So we put green fluorescent protein under control and said, you can only make this, or you will only make this, when arabinose is present. Yeah, so it'll only be the arabinose plate that will grow. Other plates tell us. Well, what do we need in experiments always? We need controls. So they're going to be controls. Mm -hmm. Nothing as is. No glowing. Right. Good question, right? So she said, is it going to grow? So we're not going to give it the DNA, which means it's not going to have the resistance, right? But there's pen ampicillin in that plate, so what's going to happen to the E. coli? It should die. It should die. On the positive one, it should grow because we gave it the DNA, right? But if it doesn't have arabinose, will it glow? No. The LB is the, um, the growth media. Remember how we use nutrient auger and TSA for our unknowns? This is just um, a different formula of food, uh, like nutrient auger or that, but um, one that E. coli really likes. It, it's, a, it's actually a person. It's a, two guys' names, which are, like, not easy for me to pronounce, too. So most of us just say LB. <laughs> okay, so good observation skills. I like this. Good preview to what we're going to talk about. So some definitions as it relates to how this system works, right? Um, and I read through these yesterday, and that was my 8 o'clock class, and they were zoning, zoning out on me. So I'm going to go to the pictures, because I think that that really helps people, and it helps me too. Um, and then if we need to, we'll refer back to the definitions. So um, arabinose is the sugar, right? And normally, for this operating system, you would have the structural genes. So these are the genes that make the enzymes to digest arabinose, right? So here, let me go to my next slide. Here's arabinose, right? In order to digest it, we need this enzyme, this enzyme, and this enzyme, right, to break it down and be able to digest it. Where is that information? In the DNA. So this is the gene, right? A-R-A-A -A -A is the gene for this enzyme, for the arabinose iso isomerase, right? Um, this enzyme is encoded for by this gene, right? So this segment of the DNA that we call ARRA -R -A for arabinose B, right, is the second enzyme in this pathway that's needed. And then look, we jump from B to D, 
Where'd C go? What's C? C is not part of the operating system. It's part of the regulation of the system. So if you look back, there's C, right? A-R-C. This one is what we call constituently expressed, which means just like BLA, as soon as you give this DNA, it's not under any control. They're going to be like, oh, DNA, messenger RNA, protein, right? No control, right? It's got it, it just always makes it, right? There's no regulation on it. It always makes it. That's what constituently expressed means. Still with me? So always it's making this protein. Well, what does that protein do? It wasn't on our list, right? It's not used for digestion. What is it doing? Well, what it's actually doing is binding to the site on the DNA called the operator. Right? So this protein made from the gene ARAC actually binds to the DNA of the operon at the operator. And when that happens, it stops RNA polymerase from being able to bind to the segment of DNA that we refer to as the promoter. Right? So this segment right here is the promoter. It's right before the stuff we need to actually make. Right? RNA polymerase binds, and then it's going to make that RNA so we can make those proteins and we can digest that sugar. When you have one that's stopping, right, we refer to this as a repressor. And actually, I have some notes here. So it's a regulatory protein, right? It binds to a short region of the DNA. So this line here is representing DNA, right? These blocks are indicating what each segment of the DNA is. So in this case, the gene product, the protein, is actually binding here, and it makes the promoter site, this region, inaccessible, right? RNA polymerase can't bind, can't continue down. Why the system can be changed and, and can be regulated is because it, we have an effector molecule. In this case, it's the arabinose, the sugar, right? So when sugar's present, the sugar that we need, it binds to the regulator protein right here. So see that little red thing? That's representing arabinose. This is referred to as an effector, right? It affects the situation as to what's going to happen. When it does that, the promoter is now available, that section of DNA. The RNA polymerase can bind. So one of the things they're not really showing you here is that this protein kind of goes through a conformation change, and it kind of no longer blocks this region, this promoter region anymore, and RNA polymerase can bind. Right, this is very simplistic. It's like stick drawing, right? A stick drawing of a person isn't very descriptive, right? <laughs> Uh, so, as we said, RNA polymerase, of course, that's the enzyme that makes RNA. Because the first step, right, is DNA to RNA, then to the protein, right? You can't make the protein without the RNA. So what, we, what they've done, right, is we still have this control mechanism, right? We have the promoter region, we have the operator, we produce the gene product, the repressor, right, in this case, the regulator that binds here. And it's the same, it's the one for arabinose. So if we put arabinose, the effector, in, it will bind here. It'll make the promoter region available. But instead of the enzymes, the structural genes to digest arabinose, guess what they put? Green fluorescent protein. So we tricked it. We're like, okay, here's some sugar, right? Sugar binds, right? So now the... The RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, and it's just going to copy what DNA is there. And in this case, instead of like in a normal cell making enzymes to digest that sugar, right, when that sugar is present, it would make sense that it would activate this, right? We're going to make green fluorescent protein instead. Make sense? Right. So we just switched it up. But because we did that, right, will it make green fluorescent protein with, without arabinose? No, because the promoter will be blocked, right? In this case, promoter can't bind. 
Sugar comes in, binds, okay, promoter goes, okay, I can use this information now because I need it, right? It thinks it needs it anyways, but we tricked it. Still with me? Kind of cool, huh? All right. So I already went over that. So as Caitlin pointed out, she was looking at her plates like, well, what's going to happen here, right? What's going to happen? We know, right, that you've got to have gene expression. You've got to actually copy that DNA into messenger RNA to make that protein. And as we just learned, that is only going to happen when we allow it to happen with arabinose. So we know gene expression and fluorescence are linked, right? You can't have fluorescence without gene expression without actually copying that information into messenger RNA and then into a protein, right? And the reverse is true too, right? Um, no green fluorescent protein means no expression. If both statements are true, then we support a hypothesis, right? And so hopefully we will support our hypotheses, right? But we also know it's conditional, right? What experimental conditions do we observe fluorescence? right, with expression. So BLA, right, that's the gene for beta-galactinase enzyme to be able to actually digest, be resistant to, in this case, a penicillin-like drug, ampicillin. Before transformation, will our E. coli have this gene? Before Transformation. What does transformation mean? We're going to give it DNA. So do, does it have BLA before we start? No. Will our control group have it? No, because we're not going to give it to it. Right? After transformation, if they're truly transformed, will they have it? Yes. They will be ampicillin resistant. All right. The first step has been done for you, right? We have our plus and minus tubes. One is the plus, meaning we're going to add DNA to it, this plasmid. And then minus, we're not going to. This is our control group. Now, I already split up the transformation solution. There's 250 microliters in each tube for you. We'll get our ice buckets out of our freezer. We'll add distilled water to them, right? We're going to put our little racks in first and then add the water to right below the top of our racks, right? And this is going to help the, the ice, the cold, get in contact with our tubes. Don't put those foam racks in. They stay wet. <laughs> those are just for holding our tubes in your bins. Uh, using a sterile loop. You're going to transfer bacteria from that starter culture I gave you. It has growth on it into each one of your tubes. Alternately, we could have put it all in one tube and then divide it in half, right? That would be um, one way we could do it. But to save steps, we, we're just going to add a little bit of bacteria to both tubes, right? We need both bacteria in both tubes. At this point, are, are those tubes different from each other? No, they just contain trans translation solution, and they're different because I labeled them different, but they're truly not different yet, right? So you, you can use the same loop, right, to add bacteria to both those tubes. You don't have to use multiple loops. Then I'm going to come along, and I'm actually going to give you the plasmid, and then after that, I'm going to shine UV light on that plasmid, right? What is the plasmid? It's DNA. Should it glow? No, because did, does the DNA fluoresce? No. What fluoresces? The protein that they're going to make from the DNA, right? So unless someone's contaminated my vial, which that would make me really unhappy, right, it should not glow, right? But we want to check and make sure, right? It's not a magic trick we're doing here, y'all. This is real science. I'm not David Copperfield or Chris Angel today. Neither are you. Although it's going to kind of feel like that, right? It's going to feel like magic. Uh, then, um, as I said, I'm going to come around and I'm going to put 10 microliters. I'm going to use the really good pipette I borrowed from Biotech across the hall. 
Um, and I'm going to put 10 microliters in your plus only tube, right? Because our minus tube is our control. What could we add to our minus tube? Now, my DNA is going to be, I'm using a pipette, so it's going to be in solution, right? What's the most common solution that we deal with in our daily lives? That shouldn't actually have any DNA in it, per se. Water, right? We would want to use sterile water, right? We're going to skip that step because it's a really small amount, right? 10 microliters isn't going to make a huge deal in our experiment. Okay, so ampicillin resistance and green fluorescence protein. We already know they're not resistant before this experiment, right? We're going to make them resistant. So before they don't have the gene, after transformation they will have it. Do they have green fluorescent protein before this experiment, before transformation? No. 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 Are they going to have it if they are truly transformed? Yes, because we're going to give it to them, right? That's what transformation means. We're going to give them antibiotic resistance. We're going to give them green fluorescent protein, but we're going to give it in an operating system, right? We're going to control that one being expressed. So our next step is to leave the tubes on the ice bath for 10 minutes, right? At this point, we'll then practice pipetting, right, with a larger pipetter, playing with our water. The plates have already been labeled for you. So in the lab manual, I think it tells you to label your plates at this time. Because as you guys have already noticed, right, not all these plates contain the same thing. So notice two of your plates are your two DNA negative control plates and two are your DNA positive experimental plates. What's the difference between your two um, negative plates? Yeah, one has the antibiotic, one doesn't. One has ampicillin, one doesn't. Would you know that if I hadn't labeled those plates? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you can't see these things. Unlike the other two plates, you guys may notice a difference. Because I put the sugar in before it was autoclaved. Um, so the sugar plate, do you guys notice anything different about that one? It's darker. The sugar caramelized a little bit. Uh, it still works, though. Um, sugars aren't as affected like proteins are to heating. Uh, these this media had to be cooled and I had to add the antibiotics to it when it was cool right before I poured it because the antibiotic is heat sensitive. So a lot of work went into putting together those plates for you guys. Um, and hence why I pre-labeled them so that, you know, they don't get messed up. Yeah. It's easier too if I put printed labels that you guys can read, right, instead of my chicken scratching too. <laughs> And it saves us a little bit of time. So you're going to bring your ice bath and you, oh, crap. Go flip the on switch on that uh, water bath, Jessica. It's on the right-hand side. Uh, yes, perfect. It'll be ready by the time we're needing it. Oh, I should have remembered to turn it on earlier. <laughs> you're going to take your whole ice bucket back to that water bath. And then that white rack is a floating rack. So even though it's not going to float in our little ice baths, it will float in the water bath. So you just pick it up, and each one of those, you'll notice, has a number written on it with mar Sharpie marker. So that way, if all of you guys are back there at the same time, you know whose rack is whose, right? Because the tubes are all the same colors. You don't walk away, because how long is it going to be in that water bath? 50 seconds. goes by really fast if you walk away. Trust me on that, all right? So you'll stand over it. You'll hover over it for less than a minute. Then you'll just take your rack and plunk it right back on your ice and carry your ice bucket back to your lab bench. There it will sit for an additional two minutes before we take it off of the ice. So what's the purpose of doing this? Why are we going from the ice bath to the warm water bath back to the ice bath? To make it more permeable, it's, yeah, we're going to shock them. We're going to do what's called heat shock, right? So if you've ever been on vacation. Yeah, I was really thinking about this. Like, I don't, like, I don't do it now. We just jump in the hot tub, get cool really quick. Um, and then you know, yeah, you're really shocking your system when you do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly what we're doing to our bacteria today. We're going from the swimming pool to the hot tub back to the swimming pool. 
right? We're, we're shocking the crap out of them today. Yeah, and many of us have done this on vacation. Yep. So we're doing this purposely to stress them and to make them more permeable so they'll take up the DNA. And as I said, this process is referred to as heat shock because we're using temperature, right? This really shocking difference between hot and cold. And as I said, this has been worked out. So they know for this system, optimum is 50 seconds. Anything less than that, not as much transformation happens. And if you go too long, transformation rate also drops off, right? So you don't want to leave it in there too long, right? I and mean, you want to leave it in there long enough, though, right? And the magic sweet spot number for this is 50 seconds. Another system that I used was two minutes. I actually hate that system because two minutes, you're very tempted to go do something else. And I screwed up several times when I was in the research lab because I walked away, right? Two minutes seems like you can get something done. <laughs> Not really. Right? 50 seconds, definitely don't walk away, right? You'll mess it up. So the next step, after the two minutes, we're going to put it onto our bench top. So you get to take the rack right out of the water bath, the ice water bath, and put it right onto your be bench top. At this step, you're going to use the larger pipette or in the blue tips. Um, we're going to make sure it's set for 250 microliters. And we're going to transfer from a little tube that I'm going to give you of liquid broth LB, food, basically, for your bacteria, right? So we're going to feed them. So we're going to use the pipette aids. And again, if you don't touch the bacteria, right, you could use the same tip or same pipette for both tubes. What I always suggest to students, do your minus one first in case you accidentally touch, and then you can do your plus one. But in a real lab, right, you would actually switch out your tips. You wouldn't run the chance, right? So these pipettes that you guys have used before just to measure one mil, these aren't easy to measure with, right? They're not very accurate. It really takes, like, really good technique. Um, and we did to a mil, right, or a 1,000 microliters. Today, you would have to be going to just this little line right here, which is not easy. And then later on, we would be going to the second indentation here. So we're not going to use those today, right? We're going to use the pipettes. Um, but I do have them, right, for the other classes that choose not to use the micro pipetters. And they're sterile wrapped, right? So we don't want to use something that's not sterile. So why do we incubate them for 10 minutes? Why do we feed them and wait 10 minutes? What are they going to do in that 10 minutes? They're not really going to grow. But we just gave them what? Before the food to transform. How, how are they going to transform? What did we give them? We gave them DNA. What can they do with DNA? Make, yeah, information to make what? Messenger RNA and then the protein. Which ones are they going to make? Which ones do they need to make? Or they're going to be in big trouble when we put them on those plates. They're going to make what protein? We're giving them two genes. BLA and green fluorescent protein. Which one are they going to make in that tube? BLA. Beta-lactinase enzyme, right? So that when we put them on the plates that contain ampicillin, what's not going to happen to them? They won't die if we give them the DNA, right? What's going to happen to our negative ones that we didn't give them BLA? They're going to die. Make sense? So that's what they're doing. They're making that, and they're making the arabinose a regulator protein, ARAC, right? They're making that protein. It's binding to the operator. So that only when we give it the sugar is it actually going to make what protein? GFP, green fluorescent protein, right? So that they're going to do later when they're growing, right? On what plate? The arabinose plate, right? So this is our control. I mean, this is time to make the 
antibiotic resistance. I got ahead of myself for a second. You're going to transfer 100 microliters from each of these tubes onto each of those plates. Yeah, you're going to spread it with just a loop. But first, we got to get it on the plate, right? And in, in order to do that, we're going to use the little micro pipetters. But those are preset at what? 50 microliters. How much do we have to put on our plates? 100. So how are we going to achieve that goal? How many times are you going to use that pipetter for each plate? Twice, because 50 times 50 or 50 plus 50 is 100. So you're going to do it twice. Two squirts, right, onto each plate. You're going to do your two plus plates, right, with the same tip and same pipette because they're the same, right? It's just the plates that are different, right, what's in the media. So you, one person can use one blue pipette with a tip and squirt twice onto both of those plates that are marked either plus, yep, in this case plus, and then you can use one of those sterile pipettes and you can spread out the bacteria on both those plus plates with that same loop, right? But then for the minus plates, you need a different tip, right? Or in this case, we've got a whole nother pipette or even, right? So someone else can squirt onto the two minus plates from the minus tube You need one loop for the plus plates, right? And one loop for the minus plates, right? Separate pipette tip for plus plates, separate pipette tip for minus plates. No, because they're the only different, there isn't any difference in the solution. There's difference in what's in the media. It won't pick up from one to the other. Yeah. Good thinking, though. I love it. Okay, um, in the lab manual, it tells you to tape your plates together. Please don't do that, right? I'll just stack them up in the incubator, um, and but we will label them, right? So, you know, put Thursday on them, put today's date. Um, we're the only Thursday class, so you can just write, you know, R for Thursday or write out Thursday. Um, write your table number, right? So you guys have table numbers. This is one. That's two. I think you guys are three. I don't know. It's written on the... Okay, so I know, so I can give you guys back your plates, right, to each one of your groups. Uh, we're going to incubate them at 37 if you want to write that as well, right? Uh, but the important information, like group number, right, write it, circle it, so I can find it, the date. So what information is provided by the LB negative plate? So that plate right, just contains food. And we're going to put DNA negative, non-transformed bacteria on there. Why are we doing that? Yeah, as our control to make sure that it grows, right? Because if it doesn't grow, then we've got problems, right? Maybe it doesn't like the media. Maybe we screwed up and somebody gave me the wrong media, right? And it doesn't promote the growth of these bacteria. Right then, our then then we know potentially if we had no growth on the rest of our plates, we're like, oh, something went wrong, right? <laughs> this is not good. We've already said this, right? Why are we doing an ampicillin plate for DNA negative? Yeah, make sure it's not already resistant, right? To prove that this bacteria before we started was not resistant to ampicillin, it will be killed. So that plate should be blank next week. Transformation can only occur if the pigoplasmid is introduced into the solution, right? If we actually put it in there. And we're only going to do that for our plus two. So which plates are going to exhibit transformation? Our two plus plates, right? The DNA plus plates. But they're not the same, are they? So although these will be transformed cells because the ampicillin would kill them otherwise, right? There is going to be a difference between our two plus plates. What's the difference as far as ingredients? One of the plates contains the arabinose, the sugar, right? And that is the plate that's going to glow. So should C put the same in A? No. Because are all the bacteria going to be transformed? 
Are all the bacteria going to grow on that other plate, though? Yeah, so you'll actually have more growth on your DNA minus LB plate. You'll have a complete lawn of growth. Where on your transform plates, remember we should have around 75 colonies because not all of the cells in the tube will get transformed. And therefore, not all of them would survive exposure to ampicillin. So the efficiency in the math, right? I said well, I was going to go over this next time. Okay, so these are our four plates, right? A, B, C, D, right? This first plate is our control to make sure the bacteria can grow, right? That we didn't kill them with heat shock or anything like that. We should get a nice good lawn of growth on this plate. The next plate is to prove that the E. coli we started with is ampicillin sensitive, right? So this plate will have no growth on it. The next plate contains ampicillin, so only what cells will grow? Transform cells, so around 75 colonies. Right, because we're going to put a measured amount on these plates, right? 100 microliters? <laughs> yes and no. Yeah. Um, is this plate going to glow? No, because it doesn't have what? It doesn't have the arabinose. This next plate, these are transformed cells, right, because of the ampicillin and DNA positive and it's going to glow because of the arabinose is going to activate that system so that we'll actually make green fluorescent protein. So no green fluorescent protein, which means no expression. In the case of these two plates, there's no expression because there's no what? DNA negative plates, there's no DNA, right? This one we don't have any expression of the green fluorescent protein because it's under control, right? It's not activated. Where This is the only one, right, where we're going to actually get the activation of that gene. So hopefully your plates will look something like this next week, right? We'll have that one that will glow nice and pretty.